Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, welcome back my dear friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you wherever you are in this part of the globe and whichever time you are uh, watching this uh, program. As you know my good name is Raghunandan Sengupta from the IME department at IIT Kanpur in India and the course is under the SWAM lecture series and the title in investment analysis and portfolio management. And today is the 14th lecture. And if you remember in the 13th one, we were basically discussing the capital market line, the CAPAM model, the pricing line. And uh, time and again, I mentioned that uh, the, the in the y axis, always you have the returns, whether capital R or small r, that is immaterial. And in the x axis, depending on how you want to view the capital line or the CAPAM model line or the pricing line, you will basically have either the standard division which is a form of risk for the uh, efficient portfolio or a form of risk. You can also mark the covariance between the efficient uh, portfolio which I denoted always as PE uh, that covariance of that efficient portfolio with the market or else we had the value of beta. And certainly as we were proceeding, I did mention that beta can also be considered as a form of risk and if you remember when trying to find out uh, the combinations of the portfolio whether short selling was there or not there, we took the ratio of excess return over risk free interest rate divided by the risk, where risk can have different color given different connotations considering once we considered as sigma, other time we consider the beta. Then at the fag end of the 13th class, we mentioned that uh, the overall risk for the portfolio, uh, whether efficient or inefficient, let us say material, it can be divided into two forms. One is the risk which can be diversified and that is coming from the white noise. Diversified why? Because if you increase, technically increase the number of assets which are there in the portfolio, it can be made theoretically 0. And one other risk was basically the one which is coming from the market which cannot be diversified. The concept of systematic risk, non-systematic risk, all these things we discussed. Slowly at the, at the end in the last slide we were discussing and the last slide will be continued here in order to bring continuity in the discussion. We did discuss that as the, uh, the concept of, of risk which cannot which can be diversified if it cannot be made zero actually the overall portfolio will move horizontally more on to the right and be inefficient in the sense that it would definitely not be one of the points along the efficient frontier considering the efficient frontier is being formed with n number of risk assets plus the nth plus 1 being the risk free interest rate so in this lecture provided i am able to cover but obviously I would not leave uh, any concept uh, untouched. We will consider the portfolio theory and the, the wrap it up and also try to start off the concept of utility theory which will be utilized later on and mainly in the concept of the second course which would be in the area of risk management in the area of finance. So, the actual uh, description of this course would be lecture descriptions and obviously if there is utility I will add that. We will consider the Jensen's index a form of uh, risk for the portfolio like sigma, beta. We will also consider the sharp index. We will consider the concept of risk adjusted interest rate. So, interest rate is basically the interest rate based on which you will analyze the portfolio. So, obviously the risk component would be factored there. We will consider the linearity of pricing, uh, something to do with the CAPAM model or the concept of APT 
APT I'll come back later because the concept what we are discussing in CAPMAP model they can also be extended to the APT model only that we have to visualize in a three dimension or a higher dimension depending on how many such independent factors you take in place of the market. And we will also consider the certainty equivalent form which will give us some idea about how the pricing can be analyzed in depth. We will also consider if time permits as I was saying utility analysis, utility analysis, utility functions, what they mean, how we can analyze the utility function considering the concept of expected utility functions and also we will consider the variance even though I have not written the concept there because variance will be coming up as I said in different flavors, different colors, different connotations and all of them would basically signify the concept of risk or some sort of loss for that overall risk the decision which you are going to take. We will consider two important properties of utility analysis which is the property of non satiation and then consider a decision maker can either love risk or be neutral to risk or would be a risk seeking person depending on the circumstances how he considers his investment his or her investment. We will consider how we can analyze the concept of a, of a decision with respect to a fair gamble and how this concept of risk aversion, risk neutrality, risk seeking property can be analyzed with respect to a fair gamble. We will consider the concept of marginal utility and how from a very simple graph we can understand uh, using the concept of marginal utility this, these three properties which are the concept of risk aversion, risk neutrality and risk seeking person. Later on um, obviously that is not the end of utility analysis, later on we will consider the concept of absolute risk aversion and relative phase risk aversion and how these two properties can be utilized to at least form an idea of what type of utility function which you use. There would be different utility functions we will consider, not all of them the few important one which are relevant and uh, we will see how these two properties of absolute risk aversion and relative risk aversion can be utilized to understand what type of utility function you are take, taking for this financial decision. Okay, this graph was at the last slide in the 13th lecture, but I will continue discussing that because I think it will be relevant for our discussion further on. So, if you if you uh, see the graph here we are considering the concept of risk which is sigma and we are considering the return, return can obviously all also be r bar small r bar and here you have the so called efficient frontier considering the market which was denoted by q initially the one fund theorem. So, here is F or the risk free interest rate lending borrowing values being the same uh, theoretically we are considering even though if it is not it, the concepts can easily be extended considering lending and borrowing are different values. So, the portion with repetition I am saying the yellow line which I am drawing is the case where you have no short selling and the portion which I am marking with green hashed is the portion where you go for short selling considering there are n number of risk assets along with the risk free lending and borrowing. Now, any point as I had mentioned time and again point means the portfolio which is being formed whether m or midpoint between f and m where you invest 50 percent in f 50 percent in m or if you go further on along the dotted lines where you short sell that means you borrow from the bank and invest more in the this portfolio of risky assets M. All of these points are efficient and if you remember we have drawn a, written these three equations that means considering simple concept of trigonometry geometry we showed that the height to base for an efficient frontier with respect to the market's height to base for the triangle which you are drawing. So, I will just draw the triangle once. consider your your 
efficient frontier uh, efficient portfolio consider the point p e portfolio which is efficient you can basically have So, the high and consider this is x, this is y and this is f. So, the ratio of p e to x, the distance, this is the length p e to x divided by the length f to x can definitely be made equal to the length of m to y divided by the length of f to y and from that we had three equations in equation 1 sigma was the risk in equation 2 I am not going to write it because I wrote it in details in each and every diagram you had basically the beta and in the third case you had the covariance between the efficient portfolio and the market M. Now, leaving aside that if now if I consider sigma square p, it consists of risk I am not writing the formula in detail risk from M which is the market. sorry and plus the risk from the error of white noise and these risk from the error we had seen it can be made zero in case it is not it it doesn't then the point of the new that a portfolio becomes inefficient and with respect to the efficient portfolio which let me mark it as in blue color p e. So, the blue one p e and the red one p e are efficient, but the combinations which you formulate in those in these two port portfolios with their efficient are different. So, the more inefficiency is there it will keep moving on to the right. And that is true, because if I consider the combination here, this is the risk corresponding to the market or the if I consider the only market risk is coming and more I move on to the right for the same level of return, because the level of return here at this point, which let me denote as say for example, z return remains the same, but the value of risk increases because along the x axis on to the right the value of risk is basically a combination of the market and the white noise which is coming from epsilon. So, here it mentions and just highlight portfolios with systematic and unsystematic risk. So, as you go more on to the right the combination of market risk remains the same, but the overall white noise increases and that is inefficient because it is below this point. So, if I use the light green one just hash it a little bit this whole area is a set of inefficient portfolios. Now, uh, and I did mention when I started the lecture. So, there would be other different connotations of risk. So, we will consider them one by one. For performance evaluation, we have the cap and model as given. So, now if you see these are the hats which I am just circling, these are hats where I am putting a tick mark. Hats are basically estimated value. Technically, technically, the equation as we know is R i 
um, is equal to R f, R f I can take on to the left side it will be minus plus beta i into R m plus epsilon. Obviously, if we take the expected value from the population, so R f remains constant, R m becomes expected value of market, beta remains constant, epsilon vanishes because the value as per the concept of assumption expected value 0. Now, we have been utilizing always R i bar here and R m bar here expected value remember. So, they are basically coming from the sample, but if we replace them actually they should be let me use a different color for better explanation they should be they should be R i hat or considering R m hat these are estimated values. So, the connotation of using R i bar hat R m bar hat remains the same. So, coming back here you have R i bar hat minus R f which is the excess return of that portfolio is equal to beta into R m bar hat minus R f. So, you may be thinking why I am adding R f here because this is just trying to find out the excess return on the market over and above the risk free interest rate and you add the error term which is considered as the Jensen index. So, basically it subsumes under itself the effect of so called anything which is happening over and above the market the white noise. So, higher the value of j if you go back to the last slide you will understand it will be moving more on to the right to give an idea that what is the overall effect the white noise has. So, j the Jensen's index is the error term overall and it gives us a sort of risk may not be directly because generally we consider beta beta as risk a form of risk or we consider sigma is a form of risk, but the value of j can be considered as the Jensen index which is the overall effect of the error term here I have just marked it. So, according to cap -AM model or the efficient frontier line we have drawn the pricing line the value of j technically should be 0 because it is there on the cap -AM line. So, any movement is not there, there is no white noise. When the true expected value of returns are used, hence J measures the approximately how much the performance of any index stock has deviated from the theoretical value, which should basically be the difference between the actual value which you are finding out and the theoretical value which you are finding out. If it is 0, it is there on the capital asset pricing line, cap -M model line. If it is not, it is basically shows an inefficient sort of thing. A positive J implies the stock did better and a negative J implies it did worse. So, that means technically if you are moving considering that the efficient is the efficient one, we will consider that the value of J is more on to the right. The value of j tells us nothing about the fund which you have formulated, the portfolio you have formulated, but instead it is a measure of the volatility of the cap -AM model. If cap -AM is valid, it is true model, then every security fund must satisfy the cap -AM exactly. That means, if we find a so called efficient portfolio security with non zero j then it will mean the market by itself in a efficient. Technically, we are considering till our last discussion the market is always efficient and the portfolios would be inefficient which are falling. If it is not, then considering the securities exactly following the cap model 
but j is non zero then by itself the market is ineff inefficient and we can calculate that accordingly oh uh, um, my apologies uh, i was trying to basically concentrate more on the uh, systematic and non systematic risk j would be moving vertically my apologies for that so when i consider the value of r along the y axis now here again if you see which i am highlighting this is beta whether you re replace beta or sigma or covariance the idea should come out to be same so again i have the cap m line market line there is a value of m here let me mark it with the uh, coloring scheme so it is absolutely clear and the value of beta we know for the market because r i bar minus r f by beta i or consider if I replace it p e p e will be equal to market value minus r f. So, this value which is there beta m we know it should technically be a value of 1. Now, if I consider any portfolio see for example, here and that is actually the market which is efficient then the value of Jensen's index should be 0. In case if the market actual the market line is this say for example, this this line actually then the height which we see here if it is positive or it is below it is negative would give us some idea about the inefficiency in the market. And the diagram which I have drawn here can also be done considering sigma, can also be done considering the covariance of the portfolio. I am not writing E here, because E would basically be efficient frontier depending on the concept which you are trying to utilize in the portfolio with M and both are efficient obviously, the black line here when I am putting a single tick and the green line when I am putting a double tick would be same they will merge. Now, further on in order to measure the efficiency of a security of the market we use S which is the sharp index another form of risk and the formula is given by this. Now, look at it very interestingly actually I have r i bar minus r f by sigma. So, why I am writing this actually should definitely be clear to you, but I will still draw it here. So, this is the line this is m this is f this I am measuring r this I am measuring the concept of sigma. So, this is a portfolio P. So, I am taking R i minus so what this point this is the numerator this is the denominator will be we will be equal to So, this is just a way of trying to expression express the same equation which we had. 
here. In order to measure the efficiency of our security on the market line, we use S the sharp index and the formula is given by this. So, this is what is there for the efficient one the black one inefficiency being the dotted one this first dotted one consider this one and the point and the line 2 is the straight line. So, if I have the ratios this first triangle the second triangle. So, for this the angle is theta 1 for this the triangle is theta 2 this is what is met, meant by theta 2. And here again just a cautionary note we are measuring sigma which is the form of risk and again r continues to be measured along the y axis. So, if in the formula which I which we discussed in the last slide tenth slide this concept using the sharp index if it is there on the market line then these two ratios technically would be same because r i r i r i minus r f divided by sigma I am not talking about sigma hat and all these things if it is equal to the ratio of the excess rate on the market over the risk free interest rate divided by market standard deviation they should be same in case not the value of s would give us some idea about the so called risk in the efficient and inefficient market accordingly. Now, consider obviously which is true, but now consider the cap m model with stochastic price. So, the prices are changing. Now, the formula which you see is exactly what we have considered earlier. So, here I am considering that it is in the long run expected value. So, the formulas may look different but they convey the same information. The first part which I just circle in red color it is basically the returns. So, technically if you re remember I had written down I 2 minus I 1 divided by I 1 which is the return difference um, which is the return which is found out by the ratio of investment or the revenues which I am getting at time 2 minus the revenues based on which I have started or an investment which I started at time 1 divided by the investment at time 1 gives me the return. So, this is technically R which for the stock prices if you were aware which I have told is log on of log of P 2 by P 1. And if I am considering R it is basically I 2 by I 1 and obviously, we know the relationship between R and capital R and small r. So, the part which is circled in 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 uh, encircled in uh, red if you see this is the price as T 1 where I put a single tick mark which is there in the numerator and the denominator and the first term in the numerator is basically the expected price at T 2. So, that that is technically I 2 which is here. So, considering we are aware of the of the returns of the investment based on that we have basically marked this equation to find out uh, r small r. Now, if I continue so this is basically a sort of r i is equal to r f which is already there plus beta which is already there. Now, again we had r m minus r f r m minus r f 
R f is already there and R m as per the concept which I am now encircling using the green color is exactly the same for the market m is given for the market. So, the expected value of the market at time t 2 minus the investment at t 1 that is i 2 minus i 1 as here divided by i 1 which is p suffix m at t is equal to t 1. The factor given below which we find out. So, if I take the value as given. So, if I add, um, uh, make a simple adjustment of the equation, the term which is given. So, you have the risk adjusted interest rate. So, this factor is the risk interest rate and the term which is coming here along with 1 when added up to R f would give you the overall risk for the portfolio considering the adjustment has been made uh, the interest rate based on the fact that the adjustment has been made for the risk. Now, this value technically if I have different prices would give me a better conceptualization of the risk which is coming from the portfolio and obviously, it will be a stochastic value changing with respect to time uh, and we can find out these values by plotting because we have R f from the data, we have the prices already given and beta can be found out from the past data, historical data if you use that technically it should be beta hat and if beta can be found out for different time frames it will give a good idea about the value of beta we are trying to use. So, now we will consider the linearity of pricing means there is no arbitrage and the certainty equivalent form which will give us some idea that how the concept of capital pricing line cap m model can be extended and you can get a better idea about the pricing concepts. Because if you remember in the initial part uh, we consider to formulate a portfolio given the returns then we slowly went one step backward considering that we want to form the portfolio right, but how we try to find out the returns. So, all the discussion which I mean going on considering the single index model all were related to finding out the pricing, uh, pricing in the sense the returns and pricing as, as I told you for the stocks would have an underlying distribution which is log normally distributed. Now, in the cap m model we have considered the returns are normally distributed if you remember time and again I mentioned when we are considering the simple linear regression, the multiple linear regression, the concepts we did mention time and again the normality was the fact which was true for the distribution of the x 1 to x k considering k number of independent variables in the multiple linear regression or only 1 x in the simple linear regression. And we extended that in the sin single index model which led us to the cap m model and the multi index model. Technically actually the r value or the returns which we are going to consider if it is normally distributed that would basically make sense of what I mean by normally distributed for the cap m model the returns. So, the, these returns are technically r and if you remember when I had uh, shown one slide where the prices were given based on which you found out the returns and returns were positive they were marked in blue, if returns were negative they are marked in red. And if I take all the returns both negative and positive I can basically have the distribution which is basically what I mean normally is distributed. But there would be cases later on we will see uh, in risk analysis uh, class in the second course. I am mentioning about the risk analysis class because many of the concepts will be repeated there and we will further go into detailed consideration of the risk. There we can consider depending on the model that we can consider the profit distribution or the 
loss distribution. By the word profit and the loss, I mean we take all the positive returns which were marked in blue or the negative returns which were marked in red and plot them. In that case, they would be skewed distribution on to the right or the left. We will come to that later on and we will see the concept of normality does not hold. We will use the concept of extreme value distribution uh, of different types. We will use the fricate distribution and see how we can plot these distributions and considering many of the risk measures, especially the concept of sharp index, uh, standard deviation or the concept of value at risk may not hold true. That means, they would not give us the good idea about the risk measure if non-normality of the distribution of the return holds. Uh, this uh, may seem to be little bit out of context with the course which we are discussing, but I thought I will just mention that. So, we will see there would be other measure measures of risk like conditional value at risk and for which uh, both for the case when non-normality of distribution of the returns are there or normality of the distribution of the returns are there, they will hold true. And we will make a differentiation considering the four basic axioms or what are the properties of uh, risk measures. We will come to that. So, in the CAPM model, we have considered returns are normally distributed. In case they are log normally distributed, then the, uh, then the modified, so here it is without going into the proof, if they are log, so let me highlight it, it will be better. Returns are normally distributed in the CAPM model and if they are considered as log normally distributed, then the modified cap m model becomes this. So, you have the expected value of r i minus r f by expected value of r i, which is almost the same way we have considered the returns is equal to the excess market return, expected value of the market that and its excess value of our r f, which is the risk free interest rate divided by expected value of the R m, which is basically a return here. So, the concept which we considered here, they convey the same meaning. Both of them, which have encircled in blue, they consider the same meaning considering the returns multiplied by beta, beta remains the same. The values may be different when we consider normally distributed and log normally distributed, but they convey the same concept of risk. So, here also you see the actual risk concept is being taken as beta and if you remember the beta formula in the normal distributed case with respect to the, I should highlight with uh, green because this is the nomenclature which I am following. So, the formula from the long normally distributed is given by this. So, this is uh, the values which I will get considering the beta value when it is log normally distributed. Log normal. So, 1 beta would be basically for the log normally distributed case if you consider and similarly you can have the beta which I am marking in red considering the normal distribution. Okay. Um, the reason why I did not go into the um, into the more details about the CAPM model and the APT, I will come to that later on. So, that will be utilized uh, more so in the second course, because we have a lot of, of concepts to cover concerning the utility theory, the different concepts of, of derivatives and so on and so forth. So, Considering the number of lectures which is 30, we will try to do justice for each and every component, but if something is left and definitely 
cover it in the second course and obviously uh, as the course progresses depending on how the, the response is this related uh, concepts would be put more into depth in the in the slides and uh, and correspondingly it will be discussed in the lectures now coming back to the concept total different concept of utility so this concept of utility even though it has got a uh, had a very rich background from the point of view of of economics and and this concept i'll try to keep it as simple as possible with respect to the concept which we'll discuss in finance and obviously if you want to do a in depth course of utility analysis and its application in finance it can be extended but i'll try to keep it as simple as possible and we'll see that how this concept can be utilized uh, later on uh, for trying to find out different optimization problems and different risk measures so what do we mean by a concept of utility so consider i am taking a decision i want to invest my time and money for a, uh, for uh, buying up or selling a stock i want to invest my time and money for doing a course i want to basically uh, try to invest money for a project wherever it is there would be some net worth or value which should accrue to me depending on the decision i am taking it can also be say for example somebody wants to uh, enroll himself or herself for a course considering the person is already working so obviously there would be a cost benefit analysis depending on what he or she thinks would be the best return so their utility concept can be utilized depending on what is the net worth the decision accrues to the decision maker so but our our discussion would be limited to the point of view of finance so different investors have different attributes characteristics and till now we have not considered that for our analysis we just consider the returns based on that we consider the sum distributions whether normal distribution log normal distributions and i did mention even though i didn't discuss what extreme value distributions and all these things of different types they can be utilized to find out the returns and based on that the human being or the decision maker decided to invest but slowly will expand that that they can be different ways or characteristic based on which a decision maker or investor can make his or her decision to invest so human beings or investors can have different properties or different inkling or or characteristics based on which they want to make a decisions of investment for different based on different characteristics attributes so let me continue reading it some of the investors may have the property of list loving they want to take a risk so some other persons are risk neutral they are not either going for risk or uh, going to uh, hate risk so they are in between and while a third category of set of person can be he or she wants to avoid risk risk averse so a purse or set of person from the same background same uh, eco economic uh, background same income group can have different sort of of risk taking ability some can be some can as i mentioned avoid risk somebody would be indifferent somebody would basically try to take the risk love to take the risk so each investor has with him with him or her an opportunity set a set which is there in front of him or her depending on which he or she can choose in which uh, element of the set or the choice in the set the person can invest and that investment decision would depend definitely depend on what is my income what is the total value of money which i have what is my risk taking pro profile and so on and so forth. this opportunity set is very specific to that person so depending on what i may have the same money as you have we have the same say for example set of of options in front of of both of us but my choice would be totally different from your choice because how i perceive the risk how i perceive the overall utility how i perceive what is the total return would definitely be depend 
depending on what my risk taking ability is with respect to what your risk taking ability is. So, let us consider a very simple example. So, I am, I am now covering a very simple concepts in, in theory and try to uh, add those theory in the, in the decision making as we proceed in the concept of Euclidean analysis. So, consider a person has in with in front of him or her two different decisions considering decision A, decision B. And if you see in the first column which I am marking in red, these are the outcome values. So, what I mean by outcome values may not be very clear to you in the first few slides, but they will become clear as I discuss more about the concept of utility. Consider they are values. The second column are the corresponding probabilities based on those values. Similarly, when I consider uh, the decision B, the corresponding outcomes are also given in column 3 and the corresponding values of probability are given in column 4. Now, one important fact, if you have noticed, you will see there are two outcomes with the same values 15, 15 and the probabilities are given as one third, one third or they can be different. So, you may be asking that <coughs> why did not I club them? The reason is that these outcome values is what the outcome values you see as an investor, you see as a decision maker. It does not mean that what is the amount of investment which you are doing. So, if I can invest 10 rupees, my net worth need not be 10, it can be 100 also. In another case, if I invest 20, the net worth can also be 100 to me. So, in that case I have I have differentiated in the sense 10 and 20 investment both are giving me the same value. You may be thinking how it is possible. It may be possible say for example, theoretically if I consider a utility function which is quadratic. So, quadratic functions if I consider they are x square value. Maybe, maybe if I consider 2 x values as plus 2 and minus 2, both of them give me values of 4. Obviously, you may think that can my investment be negative? Yes, it can be negative in the sense that the overall utility which I get can be negative. I will come back to all these things later on. So, remember this, these 15 and 15 are the outcome values, not the actual so called investment which is being made by the decision maker. Theoretically, I have considered all the probabilities are one third, make a note, some of this probability is one as it should be. Similarly, if I consider the outcome values 20, 12 and 8, similarly the probabilities are one third for each of this case, addition is one. So, it is just in order to make the problem clear, I have considered one third probability for each of these outcome values both for decision A and decision B. There is no sacrosanct concept which are being utilized. I am just utilizing the values here to, to order to make you understand. Now, if I ask you the question that if you have A and B in front of you, uh, which one will you take? So, there can be different answers to that and nothing is right or wrong here. It will only depend on your perspective how you analyze the decision. So, say for example, some of you may say well, it would mean that uh, I would more go more for A because it seems the average fluctuation of the decision variable because they are remember they are all probabilistic the fluctuation of the value for A is less than B. Well, that is right you are most welcome if you can give us uh, and have a mathematical analysis for that you are right in an answer that the fluctuation for A would be less than B. Someone one can say no, I do not agree with that. Maybe that person, second person will try to analyze the expected value, expected value for decision A and decision B and the person can say well, the uh, expected value of B may be higher. So, he or she would basically be uh, willing to take the decision B, which is fine. I will come to the answer later on, uh, one of the answers. Another person says no, I do not agree with both these decisions. I would only concentrate that. 20 is, a, is the highest value which I can get in decision B. So, I would be tempted or that person, third person will be tempted to take the decision B. That is also fine. But the underlying analysis which being done by person 1, person 2, person 3 
are correct from their perspective and overall when you analyze they would be in a way to explain their answer actually logically I will come to that later on. So, say for example, we take the, the uh, case where the second person is saying that he or she will take a decision based on expected value and I did mention that if the person thinks that B is better. So, let us concentrate not on the decision what person uh, 2 has taken, but only on the concept that he or she is willing to take a decision based on the expected value which is a good measure when you want to find out the overall payback which is coming from the utility or the net value. So, if I consider the expected value, so for uh, A it will be 15 into 1 third plus 10 into 1 third. So, these 15, 10, 15 are the realized values with the probabilities of 1 third, 1 third, 1 third and the second third value is 15 multiplied by 1 third. If I take that value which is 30 plus 40 divided by 3, the actual value comes out to be 13.33. Now, with the concept of expected value being the norm based on which the decision would be taken, let us come to decision B that is 20 into 1 third plus 12 into 1 third plus 8 into 1 third. So, that would be again considering, so here in this case it is 40 divided by 3, here also it is basically 40 by 3. Very interestingly, this value also comes out to be 13.33. So, if we are paying attention to the second person who said he will take a decision based on the expected value and he said he would take B, but the actual answer is that based on the expected value concept both the expected value of these decisions are same. So, that means U would be indifferent between decision A and decision B. If the person says no, first person says that dispersion. So, in that case considering the variance, the form the value has not been given, but I will write it down. So, considering the concept of variance, I am using a suffix A for decision A, it will be basically summation, there are three cases, it is A i minus expected value of A that is summed up for 1, 2, 3, because y 3, there are three values 15, 10, 15. And A i in each case would be 1 case would be 15, third case would be second case would be 10, third case would be 15. So, I can find out the variance here. Similarly, if I go for B, it will be again summation 3 cases. So, i is equal to 1, 2, 3. So, this is a summation because it is discrete. If it was continuous, I would have basically integrated it. So, oh sorry, my mistake, I have not added it here. It will be a square here. Here in this case, case the person would basically to find out B i minus expected value of B square. So, here the expected value of B which we are considering is equal to 13.33, which you have already found and the expected value of E A is basically 13.33 which I have already found out. So, based on that I can find out the variance for A variance of B. If both of them are equal then you will say that you are again indifferent between them considering a different measure of how you want to rank the utilities based on dispersion. If they are diff if, if they are equal obviously indifferent and if one is more one is less, you will take the less one because the dispersion of the variance for that one is less. Maybe for the third person, he or she has said that the person is willing to take risk. Uh, I would not be so sorry, I should have used the word risk later on, but the person is willing to take the decision 20 with one third probability because 
he or she is looking at the overall uh, returns outcomes and sees that for all the decisions the probability is one third. But if one third is the probability say for example, the, the, the value may come out 20 with the one probability one third for uh, decision B hence the returns is, is 20 returns means not expected value returns the outcome value is 20 which would be beneficial for him. So, in that case later on you will see why I am saying that in that case I will say the person is willing to take the risk, risk taking ability is there. While if I consider as a person fourth, fourth person which I have not mentioned till now fourth person says no he or she does not want to take that the person wants to take be as risk hated as possible then depending on what his or her analysis of the risk is the person may take that decision accordingly. Now, let us change the same problem with a slight, slight change in the values. So, for decision A it remains outcomes as 40, 15, 10 and 15, but the corresponding probabilities have changed they are no longer one third, one third, one third they are one, half, one and a half, one fourth, one fourth still the sum is 1 as it should be. For decision B the outcomes remains as 20, 12 and 8, but interestingly I have kept the probabilities as same 1 third, 1 third, 1 third sum is 1. So, in that case again if I ask this person the first, second and third and fourth and without going to much details of explanation if I only consider expected value as the characteristic based on which the decision would be taken then the expected value based on trying to find out the, the average for A decision is 13.78 and for B it is 13.33 as it was in the last example. So, in that case if I am considering the expected value of A is greater than expected value of B hence the person will choose decision B. And obviously, you can have that you may be thinking why I, I, I am only concentrating expected value. Well, there is no sacrosanct rule for that in the last slide 16 I did discuss all the four different nuances. In this case also the person one of the persons can consider variance based on these new probabilities for a half one fourth one fourth and the probability for B remains one third, one third, one third. So, person can try to find out uh, sorry V A and the person can try to find out V B and then make a decision whether I am not going to calculation whether this is more, this is equal, this is less. So, whichever is less because variance is sort of risk. So, that person will take that decision where the variance is less. Similarly, there can be the concept which I said the person wants to avoid risk, wants to take the risk those third and fourth person which I mentioned they can have different ideas about the decision. Now, to consider both 16 and 17, 17 one added point which I am saying maybe during the discussion uh, some of the viewers may be thinking why we are only considering expected value and only considering variance separately why do not you combine them it is possible. So, rather than considering the ranking based on expected value or variance I can consider expected value I am writing this decisions as A and B as it is. So, the variance of A and I can consider even though I should have used red color and blue color uh, green color, but I am using black here. So, this is sort of efficiency expected value in the numerator variance in the denominator. So, this basically is basically uh, sort of cost benefit analysis return on investment sort of thing even in the word ROI is not exactly applicable 
to utility analysis, but still I added that to make things much a little bit more understandable to all of you. So, depending on whether this is more or equal or less, we will take the decision, but obviously it, it is true that higher the value of expected value to variance, better, lower, not good. Maybe another different picture can be analyzed here. Why not, you may be thinking, why not take the ratio, I am only writing the ratio, not writing for A and B separately. Why not take the ratio of variance to expected value? Here I am not putting A and B, I mentioned that. So, in that case, I will rank them from the lowest to the highest because in the numer numerator you have the uh, risk. And obviously, we know that expected value should always be from high to low. So, here ranking them and for the case when I am considering the variance, they should be from low to high, rank them. So, I will come to more discussion about utility theory, the concepts later on and slowly try to incorporate the concepts of utility theory and the end results into more of decision making for the portfolio. Have a nice day and thank you very much.